Here we go. So today is October the 30th. This is Monday, October the 30th, Parshat Vayera. It's October the 30th, 2023. We have three or four years of, of Parshat Vayera in, in, on the YouTube channel. We are doing Parshat Vayera. And based on last week, uh, where we talked about this incredible story of Abraham and Sarah going down to Egypt, um, it just simply, I mean, it, it ignited for all of us an interest in the parallel story that uh, we find in this week's Parsha, where it's Abraham and Sarah going to Gerar. Now, this week's Parsha has just so much more material, and, and because it has so much more material, including the Akeda, the binding of Isaac, which is, of course, the most difficult troubling and exegetically rich story in the entire Torah, we tend not to give attention, as much attention to this uh, seemingly minor story of Abraham and Sarah going to Gerar and uh, what happens there. I, I almost wish that we had, you know, a year to do on this Parsha. I mean, that that's obvious. We we have to segment it and we have to study these and, and look at the different things in terms of their development. So just in, in terms of the overview of what happens in this Parsha, this is after the circumcision. So three visitors come to Abraham uh, and in their visit, they inform that Abraham that he's going to be uh, a father Abraham is 100, Sarah is 90. Sarah is inside. It's a very, very beautifully told story in terms of drawing into your imagination what is going through her mind. She's overhearing. So we have a certain kind of portraiture of Sarah as a kind of like busybody. She hears this and she laughs internally. You know what? My husband's going to, you know, you know, I'm... Uh, which is, you know, I'm not going to translate that. It just means, am I going to be able to have a child? And she laughs. And um, there's this exchange. And uh, no, they promise her, you know, at this time next year, you're going to have a child. It, then then we, we move into um, the Sodom story. God says to a you know, God says to himself, I'm gonna uh, Avraham is close to me. Avraham is someone that that has a relationship and connected to me. Uh that I've you know that there already is the sense that he is singled out for greatness. God has promised him that he will be a great nation. Uh and so God will disclose to him what he wants to do with Sodom because Sodom is an evil place. Um, and so ensuing on that is this great, really a very stunning argument between God and Abraham. Abraham says, you're going to destroy this town. Maybe there are 50 righteous people in this town. Maybe there are 40 in there. And there, it goes on and on and on in this discussion, in this argument, where Abraham protests to God and says, on behalf of innocent people, are you going to destroy the innocent along with the guilty? And, um, and in so doing, you will not be seen as the God of justice. It's a, a vexing moral argument, obviously has echoes to this day we we have to look at this argument in terms of you know innocents who 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 die at the um as a result of the evil that is committed by people around them it's it's the unfortunate consequence of of all warfare uh and there are no righteous people in Saddam barely Lot himself and his family could be considered righteous, and from there we uh, th th we 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 zoom into Lot and his family, and the very awkward story there, where where the people uh, bang on his door to 
basically want to rape his the visitors, the two male visitors, uh, and the um, the city is destroyed. He offers these people his daughters. It's they they run up to the mountains or the surrounding cliffs, and there are caves there. They think the world has been destroyed, and uh, lo and behold, incest takes place between Lot and his two daughters, and from that we get the children that go on to um, become the nations of Moab and Ammon. It's not a un, it's not a, a thick veil here in terms of what the Bible thinks about those two nations that they're both born out of incest. But what you have here is some very very. Uh, difficult stories uh, around uh, the way that people behave. Um, and if you just cast your mind back to Egypt, so Abram has had already some encounters with people. He's had encounter, and not only people, but important people and kings. And uh, he's had this encounter with the four kings and the five kings and the king of Saddam, and he's had an encounter now with Pharaoh, and he's had an encounter now and, and around him. He understands that there are people uh, in Saddam that are wicked, that are evil, and that Lot, his, his nephew, is there in that kind of surroundings. And it's, it's after the destruction of Saddam and the promise that He's going to have a child, and he is now uh, 25 years into the story that this event happens. So let's go into the story of Abraham and Sarah going to Grar. Let's pull it up here. Boom. Okay. And here we go. I hope you can all see it. Good. Thumbs up if you can see it. Good. Thank you. All right. So, Vayisa Misham Avraham Artsa Negev. He's going from this vicinity. I'll show you in a second where that is. Artsa Negev to the Negev. Vayeshev ben Kadesh uvein Shur vayagar bigrar, and he sojourns in Grar. So we can't escape hearing the. Little play on word by Yagar, by Yagor, by Yagar, by Yagor, by Grar. Okay. By Omer Avraham, El Sarai Ishto. Avraham said to Sarah's wife, She is my sister. I should point out, Avraham said of Sarah's wife. I'll talk about that in a second. She is my sister. So Avimelech, king of Grar, sent and had Sarah taken. By Elohim El Avimelech, God came to Avimelech in a dream of the night, and said to him, Here, you must die, because of the woman whom you have taken, for she is a wedded wife. And Avimelech had not come near to her. He said, My lord, would you kill a nation, though it be innocent? Agoy, kam tzadik, tarog? He did he not say to me, Hello, who am Arli? She is my sister, Achotihi, and also she, the he. She said, Aga, he is my brother, Achihu, with a whole heart and with clean hands. Have I done this? God said to him in the dream, I also know that it was with a whole heart that you did this, and so I also held you back from being at fault against me. Therefore, I did not let you touch her. Okay? But now, return the man's wife. Indeed, he is a prophet. He can intercede for you and live. But if you do not return her, know that you must die. Yes, die. You and all that is yours. Early in the morning, by Ashkem Avi Melech Baboker, called on his servants. He spoke all these words in their ears, and the men became exceedingly afraid. Then Avimelech had Avram called and said to him, What have you done to us? 
And what did I fail you? That you have brought me and my kingdom into such great fall. Deeds which are not done to be done, you have done to me. And Avimelech said to Avraham, What did you foresee that you did this thing? Avraham said, Indeed, I said to myself, Surely there is no awe of God in this place. They will kill me on account of my wife. Then, too, she is truly my sister, my father's daughter, however, not my mother's daughter, so she became my wife. Now it was when the power of God caused me to roam from my father's house that I said to her, let this be the faithfulness that you do to me. In every place that we come, say of me, he is my brother. Then Avimelech took sheep and oxen, servants and maids, and gave them to Abraham, and returned Sarah, his wife, to him. Avimelech said, here, my land is before you. Settle wherever seems good in your eyes. And to Sarah, he said, here, I have given a thousand pieces of silver to your brother. Here, it shall serve you as a covering for the eyes for all who are with you and with everyone that you have been decided for. <clears throat> Avram interceded with God and God healed Avimelech, his wife and his slave women, so that they gave birth. For God had obstructed, obstructed every womb in Avimelech's household for the sake of Sarah, the wife of Avraham. Okay, so so I'm going to stop it here, and we're going to go through it uh, a little more with a microscope in a second. But but you know, this is this is an astounding story. This, this is an amazing story, in the sense in in so many levels. I mean, just having read it now a little closer than you know we've read it before. I mean, what are your first impressions here? What what do you what what took place here? What's going on here? I'll try and explain it in a little depth, but just give me your your reactions here to this. Anybody right away? Go ahead. There's, there's a lot of misunderstandings as to people's motivations and where people are coming from and what their what their um, um, moral stature is okay so so one of the questions that <clears throat> the reader has to be engaged with is what is everybody's motivation here i mean the bible is is being the bible the bible is not really gonna gonna flesh this out if this were a novel we we'd get much more information here or maybe not and of course you know as we know that's the strategy of the bible the bible is a is a book that is is difficult only because it makes a demand on you. The demand that ma it makes on you is to to ask these questions. What are the motivations, John? Well, this may be blasphemous or not praiseworthy, but I'm thinking Abraham's thinking it worked once, so maybe it'll work again. I don't think that's blasphemous at all. I think that that's 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 the plain reading. I in fact I would go further than you and say he doesn't come out too good in this story he 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 in fact is a kind of anti-hero in the story he he looks pretty bad in the story okay uh marlene yeah you you well, yeah. two things one he didn't even ask her this time last time he asked her and so there was a certain complicit activity yes this That's time right. he just said what he said but i don't well, understand is how Avimelech thought that the whole people were going to be destroyed when God said to him, you will die. Yeah, very good question. So so on both points, <clears throat> there, there's, there's what to say here. Um, you know, we need to ask the question, what's, what's in the relationship between Abraham and Sarah that it would be reflected in, in the way that Abraham talks here? And two, why is uh, Avimelech concerned about about the the um, the, into, the his entire tribe or people or clan? It's it's more than a clan. It's it's he's a king, so there's there's a nation there, um, and and we only get a, a hint of that at the end of the story, and that the end of the story actually serves as a kind of punchline, and the end of the story spoiler is is that. The, as soon as she was taken, something happened 
And what was discovered was only discovered along the way. We'll talk about that. I'll try and answer that question in more depth a little later. Bob, then go ahead, and then Nalana. Go ahead. Uh, one thing that strikes me is that Hashem appears to Abimelech in a dream. I don't believe that happened with Pharaoh, and I wonder why. Okay, very good question. Well, uh, we could do the chart and ask, you know, what's the difference between Pharaoh and Abimelech? And it will soon become clear to us that there's a huge difference. Um, and, you know, just a couple of things that that may, may you know, are, I'll, I'll hang, dangle out there. Of course, Pharaoh is, you know, world power. Avimelech is a local power, okay? Yeah. <clears throat> it would be like saying, you know, Pharaoh is the president and Avimelech is like a governor, okay? Uh, and Pharaoh has a different geographical realm. And Pharaoh also, more importantly, has a different religious kind of culture there. Uh, and that's important. Ilana, go ahead. I'm, I'm confused because it does say Vavimelech lo karavelea. He doesn't so go he, near her. Yes. So why is he being accused? Exactly. Good question. So does he try to go near her? Does he and and is you know it's like there's a force field around her or is is did something happen to prevent him from coming near to her the the you know after he took her so so i i, I would just offer the following conjecture which is you know this is an adult uh, audience here so given the fact that there's all sorts of sexual innuendo in the story and of course it comes on the heel of the Saddam story which is laden with all of these kinds of things including both um you know incest and what the bible you know the, 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 this kind of violent homosexuality um and on top of that we have you know the insinuations of the previous story of, of egypt so there there's a there's a, it's not even innuendo, it's pretty, pretty overt here. Uh, so something must have happened as, uh, in, in order to prevent him from going near her. And, and perhaps that could have been whatever that plague was. And, and, you know, the plague could have been something that rendered everyone kind of incapable of sexual activity and and of course certain diseases will do that to you marlene herman oh sorry Ilana, for a uh, i just um i mean uh maybe just wanting or the desire of wanting to be with her is considered a sin well maybe it is and 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 that needs to be you know put on the table too maybe it is or or you know he he will have to read that verse. We're going to read it closely and, and try and ask these questions. Go ahead, Marlene. Well, she know we know on some levels that she was available because we learned in the Hachnasat Orchim when the when the angels come that uh, she's going to have a baby, so that she's available. But just being an apicorus, Pharaoh wanted to kill the babies. And in this set, um, story, Abraham is going to kill the baby. Abraham is going to kill which baby? Uh, Isaac. Because he puts Sarah in danger. He puts Sarah in danger, and later he's got the the Akeda. Okay, so 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 we see the death of a child in various opportunities. Right. Well, uh, we know that he doesn't end up doing that. And and uh, while I'm not devoting this class to the Akeda, I, I think Thank a you. very strong case could be made that he doesn't want to do that at all. Um, and he, he tries to, at every turn in that story, avoid doing that. Okay, so, so let's, let's go into the text here and try and answer some of these and other questions that come up. Okay. So I, I just putting up here as, uh, on the map, uh, this is very, very helpful, I think, just to, 
you know, we're seeing this this map in different ways uh, today, of course. Um, and just just to help us, you know, locate the region that we're talking about. So, um, where is Sodom? Some people actually put Sodom over here. Some people put Sodom over here. It's it's you know in a Dead Sea region. Uh, you you might recall in a previous class that we had on this, I, I was stunned when I learned uh, of a, an archaeological discovery that um, there had been uh, a meteor impact or uh, akin to uh, the kind of explosion, I mean, many, many hundreds of atomic bomb explosion. Uh, there's evidence of that in the area. And so uh, what that that the Bible's the Bible's recollection of this area as a heavily watered and fertile land. Okay, now you, uh, I am sure, all of us have at one point or another taken our little bus ride down from Jerusalem to either Masada or to the Jordan Valley. I mean, we're, we're all getting nostalgic and and winsome about about uh, these kinds of trips. But if you just imagine the grinding gears of a big egged bus or a bus going down to the you're going down many many hundreds of meters to this area and it's pretty desolate down there the dead sea is called the dead sea because you know there is water that goes into it but there's no water that goes out of it uh but um it the 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 archaeological evidence geological evidence shows that there, there had been something there, uh, you know, well-watered land that was complete. The ecology, the ecosystems of that area were completely destroyed and uh, irreversibly changed by this destruction. Now, the Bible relates to this destruction as the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, and, and, okay, uh, but but around that is you know the, the in the in the Torah itself Lot will um, live in a very very beautifully pastured irrigated um, it, the the land is described as the Garden of Eden and like Egypt which is which is very very interesting the way the Bible hints something about this area this area. It, it does not derive its water from heaven like the rest of the land of Israel. It doesn't depend on the rains. It, at one point, had depended only on either uh, runoff or aquifers or uh, other kinds of surface uh, water, and that, of course, all was destroyed. Lot lived there. That was destroyed. And so Abraham, when it tells us that Abraham traveled from there to the Negev, it means he's going to about here. So th this map postulates three different places for Gerar. Uh, and you can see that they are, you know, this one is close to what we now, of course, are seeing daily, you know, in the news, the near Gaza. And these this is more like central Negev. These are the areas that that are deeply, deeply affected by the current war. And this is a little closer to Beersheba, uh, Beersheba being a further further south. And of course, if you just went to the map beyond that, you would be uh, down near Elad. So he's coming pretty much from this area or area of Sodom. Okay, so then now we're going to go to the question, what does he say to her? And how is he talking to her? Vayomer Avram el ishto achotihi. So I've divided the verse into two, and and I'm noting that the first part of the verse is actually quite awkward. Okay, it's a very awkward formulation of of this information, and everybody picks up on it, including uh, our translator, the one I, I I like to use the most, which is Everett Fox, who, following commentary and following basically, you know, the the gist of this, is saying that. You know, Vayomer Avram el Sarah Ishto Achotihi. Now he uses, you know, it's 
if you were to to translate the word L as two, then then you could say as follows: Abraham says to Sarah, his wife, "She's my sister," which makes no sense. Uh, so there is another less common translation of L, L as Al Ayin Lamed, about or of his sister. Sorry, above about his wife, she is my sister. So the first, these words kind of conjure in our minds that that we have um, this nomad, this pastoral nomad. He comes with his flock and his retinue of people, as he always does. And there's an interaction that's going to take place between this nomad uh, who is going to sojourn or wants to sojourn, or wants permission to be adjacent to a kingdom, a small kingdom, albeit, uh, and uh, the, it, somebody meets him, like, you know, it's not going to be a border control, but but scouts or people or others, you know, met, or pretty, you know, maybe the king himself, and says, um, so he says, it doesn't say to whom, she is my sister. So he says, she is my sister. Okay. Uh, now, I, I've always thought that there's another possible way of interpreting this, which is that the two of them have an internal code. Okay? Right? And they that he says to her, she's my sister, and she understands, yeah, that's code for, you know, the same deal. Whenever we're in this problem, we we have this deal where where I pass myself off as your sister. And, and, and um, you know, uh, husbands and wives do have private kinds of codes between each other. And, and they'll, they'll, uh, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll motion to each other under difficult circumstances when they want to communicate something hidden from another person. I mean, I don't know. I, you know, when, I'll just close it here just to get your reactions from this because, you know, if if you attend a party with your uh, spouse, partner, person, right, and, you know, you want to leave, but you don't want to say you want to leave because you don't want to draw attention to yourself, you know, what do you do, right? <laughs> so it sometimes it's a kick under the table or it's, a, you know, uh, you know, some kind of squeeze or Morse code or, you know, <laughs> what do you say? So, you know, I, I, that's just a banal example of, 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 you know, the way that, that husbands and wives communicate with each other. They, they, they do communicate in code. It doesn't, it wouldn't surprise me if that they have a code. She's my sister. That's their shorthand for, you know, this is the play in the playbook. I don't know if anybody wants to react to this. What did we miss here? We someone we lost. Anyway, so so uh, you you all get that. Okay, so so we will move on. So th at that point, we don't know. I'm, I've divided the verse between part one and part two here. So Avimelech and Agar had Sarah taken. Well, wait a second. So you know. What kind of man is he? What kind of king is he? What what's going on here? Why does he want to say it? so? We have Rashi. Rashi says, uh, um, "Sorry, Rashi is giving the comment that El Sarah Ishto equals Al Sarah." That that, and and we have. Uh, I, I wanted you to compare this to the Egypt story to just to 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 bring it into a sharp contrast. Just to go back, now there was a famine in the land, and Abraham went down to Egypt to sojourn there, for the famine was heavy in the land. It was when he came near to Egypt, he said to his wife Sarai, now here I know you are a beautiful woman to look at. It will be when the Egyptians see you and say she is his wife. They will kill me, but they will allow you to live. Pray, say that you are my sister, in order that may go well with me on your account, and I, may, uh, I myself may live thanks to you. So he, you know, there's a, there's a whole rich dialogue. So one interpretation we can offer is that they're speaking in code. Another interpretation, I'm sorry, I, I glossed over this, is that the relationship has already been affected by lots of things here. 
you know, she's she's been a good, dutiful, loyal partner to him for 25 years. Uh, and the Hagar episode happened, one Hagar episode happened already, which is he she told him, go sleep with my handmaiden because I want a child. And so uh, he does. <laughs> Always, you know, feel a little critical about Abraham because... He, you know, as loyal as he is to his wife, when at that, you know, the moment that she tells him to do this, he does this, and and that changes the whole dynamic of the family, uh, and she is not very happy about that, and so there's a lot of friction between the two of them, and she, you know, is very mean to her, and there there's already a sense in that Hagar Abraham discussion and Sarah you know little uh encounter that that there's a lot of tension between him and her uh and and you know certainly if I if I kind of plot the marriage out to the end by the end of the marriage there's they're living in separate locations she dies he's very attentive to her death and then you know following her death he he gets really busy and he makes an entire new basically a new set of nations um so so there we're on the timeline of their relationship it's 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 a very tense relationship uh and so on the one hand they could be speaking in code on the other hand he could not be speaking to her at all and and there's a certain disdain for her here and you know it doesn't matter okay so then let's go let's let's take another conjecture which is why you know why does he go to Grar, he goes there because he can't he can't live anywhere. He can't live in the places where it was all destroyed. That's what Rashi says. When he observed that the cities had been destroyed and the travelers ceased to pass, there's no economic activity there. He went away from there. Another explanation: he journeyed from there to get away from Lot to gain an evil reputation because of his incest with his daughters. Okay, and there are other things. You know, he he can't do what God has done. Malbim, uh, you know, a 19th century commentator. He says, He knew God's will. He didn't want to be in one place. He couldn't be in one, he couldn't be settled in one place to evangelize. He needed to be, be a sojourner and go around. And because this world is nothing, or, you know, just like, you know, he, he, he he needed to he needed to get busy in in doing God's work. I think it's a very nice pious answer, but he's moving. I think because he has to move, and because there's a sense that the land and uh, that belongs to him, and there's a sense that he's kind of foraying into different areas of the land. He's already been in the hill country of of Canaan, and he has been to Egypt, and he's been around. He, this is a man who who. It doesn't really like to stay put. Okay, that's another thing. So the meaning of the way he relates to Sarah, we see, you know, the two things. The two one, he speaks directly to her when he when in the Egypt episode, and here he speaks indirectly of her, and that suggests the the conflict in the relation. What are the motives behind his deception? Well, what are the motives? You know, he wants to survive. Um, but he's also he's also a little cruel here. Yeah, we just can't, you know what? We're not going to excuse him here. Now the second part of the verse. There's no interaction. There's no dialogue. There's no negotiation. You remember last week we talked about, you know, say you're my sister because that way, you know, if someone wants to get involved with you, we can negotiate. And, and, you know, if it gets too difficult, we can just simply run in the middle of the night. Here, there's nothing. Here, she, he just takes her. So why? Well, the obvious reason is that she's beautiful. But wait a second, she's really old. She's 90. So the Midrash says, her flesh was rejuvenated, her wrinkles smoothed out, and her original beauty was restored. This is in the Talmud, Amar of Chista. Am achar shenit bala habasar. Right, so lots of oil of olay and other kinds of you know 
uh, remedial substances that get her back to her beauty. And miraculously, she is as beautiful at 90 as she was at whenever. Okay, and, and uh, all right. But Nachum Sarnab provides a very interesting little interpretation here. The text is silent about her beauty. It's quite possible that the king's goal was an alliance with the patriarch for purposes of prestige and economic advantage. Wow, that's interesting. What an interesting look at that. He's saying, you know what? And it, it stands to reason that marriages in antiquity are forms of alliances. This is his sister, after all. And he is not a, a, a poor guy. He, you know, people know about him. His reputation is known. And he's got a large retinue of, of staff and sheep and, and lots and lots of things. So it would be to his advantage to form an alliance. And how would he form an alliance? Well, he'd take the, you know, a, a woman from his household. Now, it's his sister, so why not, right? Why, let's more make an alliance here. I think it's a, it's a very, it's compelling in the sense that it may, it's an out-of-the-box idea that fits very much in a different box if you don't know that Abraham is on a, you know, has been covenanted with God, if you don't know anything about him other than, you know, what you see, he's a wealthy man, and that he's got, you know, there's one eligible woman in his retinue, let's, you know, I mean, Hagar, you know, is there, and Hagar has a child, so she's not available to him. So, you know what, I'll go for the one that's available, and let's see if we can make uh, a deal basically and there's something compelling to that answer i don't know if i if i if it's convincing any of you but uh i, I think it's worth it's worth you know at least uh perusal your observation okay so let's go on we have then you know i put the question mark here to see if if there would be any agreement here and of <laughs> course uh i i've gotten a negative reaction i think <laughs> When we have the Bathsheba story, we have that kind of alliance business. You have tons of alliances with King Solomon. King Solomon, you know, will will marry anything that moves, practically, <laughs> right? To make an alliance, you know, and 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 that was the whole point of the rule in Deuteronomy that you shouldn't marry lots of women. You shouldn't marry lots of women, not because of sex only, but because by having all of these different alliances, it 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 means that you are focused on foreign relations. Okay, that the 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 you know it's it's interesting to put it in these kinds of political terms because the, the they matter. You know, if you're a kingdom, you need you need some kind of foreign ministry and foreign relations. Well, how did that transpire? Transpired through diplomatic marriages, and. Uh, what Deuteronomy says is don't, don't get involved in that because it will, it will dilute your attention from the, the, the kingdom. The kingdom needs your attention and you shouldn't have to worry about your alliances and your need to feel a presence in the region. You're not here to build an empire is what Deuteronomy is saying. It's fascinating, right? You know, we, 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 we often, are, are accused of this or accused, uh, you know, especially now, you know, colonialist and dominating and Zion, you know, all that stuff to be, you know, and, and basically what the Deuteronomic principle is, you know, as we would say, even today, it's just, just leave us alone, leave us alone. You know, can't we be just one little area? We're not making any demands on anybody. We don't have hegemonic dreams. And the Bible does not project a hegemonic, a dream on anybody and when it when the kings become hegemonic in their desires that's when everything goes wrong okay so then what happens avimelech god comes to avimelech in a dream okay and you ask the question wait a second you know what what makes him dream worthy right you know god doesn't just visit anybody in a dream and and this is the beautiful question because it really makes us ask 
Well, what kind of man is he? Is he uh, a worthy man? Now, we, we, we don't know anything about him other than he's a king, and other than maybe, you know, he, he either takes this woman out of sexual desire or takes this woman out of political desire, but it doesn't seem that there's anything wrong with him morally and that he is, you know, up until this moment, there's there's nothing to blame here. He's a blameless individual. But God appears to him in the middle of the night in a dream and says, you're going to die. Because the woman you have taken, she's a wedded wife. And so in this dream here, in, in Hebrew, they say, Nafalo Asimon. It's a beautiful, untranslatable expression, meaning like, ah, he finally gets it. It clicks, right? It finally clicks. What clicks with him? Well, we're going to see what clicks. We go, we know the end of the story that there's a plague. So, he, you know, he gets the idea that something is wrong here. And the, the thing that is wrong here is because of this almost fatal, potentially fatal mistake that he made by taking this woman accidentally. I mean, you know, she was here. I don't you know how am I supposed to, what am I, what am, it's like he's saying, what am I supposed to do? You know, I'm, I'm the king. I, you know, she's here. I want to make an alliance or whatever. You know, do you blame me for doing this? I, I didn't mean anything. But God says to her in a dream, she's a wedded wife. So since when does God visit people at night? Because Avimelech is, is actually a decent guy. Just a, you know, interesting way to study the Bible is look at the expression Ba'ulat Ba'al, only appears in Deuteronomy again. And look at that what it says in Deuteronomy 22.22, Ki ish ochev im isha ba'ulat ba'al, if a man is found, so witnesses, witnesses find this man lying with a married woman, both of them shall die. So under biblical law, they, they're both liable. So both of them are liable. So she is liable as well. But in the dream, God says, you are going to be liable. So there's, we know that there's a problem here. Okay, we're going to move back beyond that. So beneath the surface of God's severe accusation, the reader must wonder whether Abraham and Sarah should be blamed for Avimelech's actions, rather than the innocent and deceived king. That's Jonathan Grossman in his book, right? So, in other words, the, the, what, what, what he says here, what the purpose literarily of this exchange is, is it just dials up a notch, the tension in the story, which is the tension that you all kind of evoked at the beginning, which is, you know, he doesn't look good in this story. There's... There's culpability here. There's moral culpability here. Our perfect moral Abraham is not so perfect and not so moral, right? He's He is willfully deceiving an innocent and seemingly decent man. Avimelech is a decent man, okay? And Avimelech, it, we get another dial-up of the tension. Avimelech had not come near her. This is the narrator saying this, okay? So how does the narrator know that he didn't go near her? Okay, I love the omnipresent narrator knows that no hanky-panky took place between Avimelech and Sarah, okay? And he says, my Lord, would you kill a nation, though it be innocent? So all of us are attentive to biblical phrases and biblical ideas, and like what is the ching-ching for you when you hear this kind of sentence? Would you kill a nation so it would be innocent? What, is, what occurs to you first? I'm just going to close and ask you to put, tell me, blurt it out. Marlene, Where? what's he referring to? Well, that there was going to be some kind of a, a destruction of everyone. Okay, but what does it sound like? How Sodom. Does it, Sodom, right. John, you got it, okay. We just had a story in which Abraham, the most moral, righteous, you know, upstanding person, argues with God, <laughs> argues with, and we 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 put that on the flagpole. Look at our righteous ancestor arguing with God about you know uh, about uh, the the uh, collateral damage of destruction and the moral the moral 
flaw, the moral obscenity of killing innocent people in the destruction of Saddam, yeah. right? This, how did Abimelech uh, know that, though? How do, he doesn't know. This is the Bible talking with, with, as we like to used to say when you visit, you know, the the some what dairy re re restaurant was it? You you go you get your blintzes with two dollops of sour cream. This is two dollops of irony. Okay, it's, it's a dollop of irony. I mean the the boy uh, the joy of this is it's just showing it into your face. Look at the irony here. This perfect human being Abraham had such moral fiber to challenge God, and here a man who's decent and did nothing and blameless, you know, says the same, basically the same thing. Hagoi gam tzadik tarog, you're going to kill a whole nation because, because I didn't know this. I didn't do anything wrong. I didn't do anything intentionally wrong. There's no moral or even ethical basis upon which you could even say this to me, God, that I'm going to go be put to death. Okay, I'm going to uh, back to the text here. Um, and so it's, he says, would you kill an innocent? So that's the narrator. And the effect of, the na of having a narrator say this, I think, uh, produces irony. It's, it's just the literacy, the, liter the literary nature of this is just so gorgeous, right? The narrator is putting this into his mouth and saying, you know, do you, do you, not, do you not see what's going on here? Okay. And the effect of the question is to simply make the parallel between what happened now and what happened with Abraham. Really the same kind of question. And then he says the following. And, and I, I put it out like this to just kind of emphasize the kind of staccato nature of this, of the of the exchange. Did he not say to me, Hello, who amar li achotihi vehigami amra? Look at look at you know and and the staccato nature of his talk is is it conveys urgency. It conveys just the 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 sense something is wrong here. You did something wrong to me. I didn't do anything wrong here. All right. He she said that she is my sister. He said she is my sister. She also said he is my brother. And these are all coded words that that the ear, the biblical ear hears. You know, God has already said to, to Abraham, Be whole. I, and Avimelech is saying, look, I'm the wholehearted one here. Okay, it's irony. And so we go on, and the, the, the text goes for, but but here, this is the, the punchline, okay? When when the confrontation happens, and 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 I could go back to it, but we don't have the time. So Avram says, after being queried by Avimelech, he says, Ki amarti. I said to myself, Rak ein yirat Elohim varguni al dvar Surely there is no awe of God in this place. They will kill me on account of my wife. In other words, and maybe we'll just go back briefly and, and see this. Okay, so I'm, I'm reading the text now. So what what did what did what do you see? He says he's my brother with the whole heart, with clean hands. I've done this. God said to them in the dream. I also know that it was with the whole heart that you did this, but don't uh, I did because I didn't I didn't let you touch her. Now return the man's wife. He's a prophet. He'll intercede for you. But if you don't, you'll die. In the morning, early in the morning, by Shkem Avimelech Baboker, and that. Is another narrator's irony because Avram is always the one that wakes up in the early in the morning. He calls the servants and they give him back the wife. Avimel called Avram, What have you done? How did I fail you? Why did you bring me great fault? What did you foresee this thing? Avram said, I said to myself, There's no awe of God in this place. They will kill me. Then too, she is truly my sister. And then he gives this kind of mealy mouth. Excuse, you know, she really is my sister because it's really, you know, whatever. It's just narishkeit, okay? If she were wearing a burqa, nobody would know how beautiful yeah, Exactly, it was. okay. And now it was by the power of God caused me. He's giving excuse after excuse after excuse. He looks really horrible here, okay? All right. Then Avimelech took sheep and oxen and servants and maids and gave them to Avimelech. Avimelech said, here's my land before you, settle where And Sarah, here I've given you a thousand people to your brother. This is his way of kind of shtuching back, 
All right, a little sarcasm, your brother. It's your husband, but it's your brother, okay? And then Abraham interceded, and God healed Avimelech, because God obstructed every womb. So this is what happens. This is the story. The story is that, how long does it take for you to discover that that the whole your whole nation is not producing children, okay? A week goes by, you know, it, it, I, I've heard this from Benny Law, I'm going to have a quote from him in a second, and he, he explained it beautifully. He says, look, you know, a week goes by, you know, everybody's in their, their normal marital lives, two weeks go by, three weeks go by, four weeks go by, and and nobody's getting pregnant, nobody's, you know, how long does it take to discover you're pregnant? Well, you know, we know that you can take a pregnancy test within a few days. Uh, in antiquity, you would probably notice that you missed a period, so so you would discern from that, most likely, that that was the test. I'm sure they probably had other kinds of folk tests for, for pregnancy. So it would take a month, maybe two months, and then people, you know, he describes this nicely, you know, you know, women talk to each other and say, you know, what's going on? We're not, you know, nobody's getting pregnant. There's no, nothing happening here. And suddenly there's a discovery that it, it becomes a kind of crescendo, you know, whisper among the people, there's something wrong here. There's something wrong. There's something wrong with the water here. There's something wrong with the air here. There's something, we're, you know, we have, everybody is sterile. And how long does it take to discover that everybody's sterile? And how long would it have taken, you know, Avimelech to discover that maybe he is not able to touch her, go near her, because maybe he has no libido, maybe there's no sexual desire. And how long would it take for all the men of Grar to say, uh, you, you, you know, <laughs> you know, how's it going? Uh, well, it's, you know, I... You know, who knows what the conversations would have been in the, the pre-Viagra world, okay? And and this is the point. The point is that that the, there's there's this what happened affected everybody's life in the most intimate way possible, okay? In in right in the most intimate personal way of intimacy, sexual intimacy between husbands and wives of Gerar, and they're all innocent. And this happened because of this event. And this is terrible. And he's responsible for it. And he's responsible for it because of one assumption. And the assumption is, in the punchline, I thought there was nobody who feared God here. I thought that the fear of God didn't exist here. And I want to share with you, I've translated this from Benny Lau, um, and abridged it a little bit. And and it's he says it beautifully. It's in Hebrew, but but here's my translation of it, and 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 it's very poignant. And, and for this uh, I go I call it the assumption. What kind of region vicinity is it easier to be a person of faith? If you have an abundance of economic prosperity, if you have no worries about what you're going to eat today, if you have no worries of any kind of economic stress, your world is a very uh, world that is very secure, like pre-destructed, destroyed Saddam or Egypt. Egypt is an economically secure world because there's food in abundance in Egypt. And Saddam is an uh, economically secure micro region because there's water there. It's a world in which your eyes are not turned to heaven. You don't have to worry in those worlds because you get the water out of the ground. You trust other people together with a certain sense of self-sufficiency. In those societies you, where wealthy wealth exists, you, know, you don't have to worry. You lack any necessity for dependence on God. The alternative is when there's a terrible stress or a series of calamities, or I would add drought, or I'd add you know, a place like a desert, that shake all the foundations of security. So Pharaoh in Egypt, after all the series of plagues which, which shake him, suddenly has to recognize that there's God. Abraham goes out into the world afraid. He's afraid that it's a world that there, in which there is no God. Sorry, the wrong. Yeah. It's a world in which human beings are cruel to one another. This is his experience, and this is his presumption 
upon exiting Ur Kazdim, going to the land of Canaan, from hearsay and from his own experience. But also, you know, the 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 rumor through folklore and who knows what else that they are sexual um, deviants that exists in there's there's all sorts of sexual immorality that exists in in the land of Canaan. And the reason why they have that I, I, I is because you know Canaan from the the very word go from from the story of Noah, Canaan is seen as a, a, a sexually um, uh, not only immodest but immoral. There's t- total sexual immorality associated with with Canaan and cruelty, of course. And there's no fear of God in the world, and that's his presumption. I'm going into the world, and the world does not have any morality in it. There's no fear of God in the world. He goes out into the world as a very pessimistic man. He thinks that because human beings have not yet discovered God, that humans have already placed themselves as gods. And that's why Abraham fears going out into the world. So he tells Sarah, everywhere you go, you have to tell people you're my sister because we don't have any chance of surviving in a cruel world under these circumstances. In other words, always be perceptive of human evil. It's so... so. I, I read Sharansky's memoir. Sharansky has a, a beautiful scene in his memoir where his father tells him as he is, the first thing that he, his father tells him when he's like five or six years old, it says, the world is evil. There's evil in the world. And you have to hear the truth in the world. There's a lie out in the world. And this is what he learns when he's a six-year-old child, Okay. The first thing you learn in the world is that the world is evil. And that's the presumption that Abraham is telling Sarah. The world is evil, and you're going to go out into the world. So when we go out into the world, we need a pact. Our pact is a mutual protection pact. You tell everyone that you're my sister. If the person who triggered this belief in the king of Egypt, Pharaoh. Pharaoh looks at, at the entire world with the approach of dominance. Okay? And and. Abraham makes the deduction that the world is like Pharaoh, right? Pharaoh wants to control everything and see everything as an object. And that is to say, he wants to see use everyone, and everyone including Sarah. Because <clears throat> in Egypt, there's no fear of God. In Sodom, there's no fear of God either. We see in Sodom that people there do not fear God. There's a sense of personal security there, a sense of economic prosperity. People do not fear God. And there, Sodom... It's a place that's filled with water, filled with money, and filled with the absence of God. When Abram goes to Gerar, he makes the assumption that he's going to a place like Egypt or Sodom. He makes the assumption that there's no fear of God in that place. It's very interesting. It's a place that lacks water. Gerar is at the edge of the Negev. We saw the map. They have to work at digging wells. When a person has to dig for water, he becomes dependent on other people, has to look into other person's face. People who hike in the wilderness know that there's a common etiquette of leaving either water or some kind of uh, of, uh, of of container just in case someone doesn't have water. These people in the wilderness know what it is to live without water or with any kind of guarantee. The story is very much like Egypt, but very different. The Egypt story of Sarah. It's very interesting to see Abraham's mistake. It's very interesting to see the way Abraham simply cut and pasted his experience from Egypt onto the experience here in Gerar. He thinks that everyone... Everything needs to be met with pessimism because there's fear of God anywhere, no fear of God anywhere. But suddenly the story comes and teaches us that Abram has made a mistake. There's no fear of God in Egypt, no fear of God in Sodom, but there is fear of God in Gerar. In other words, there are places in the world where people do fear God. And so that is a is a remarkably refreshing way of seeing the story, which is to see that. I don't want to say that this is a moral failure of an Aram, but this is a character moment in his life that he has to recognize that there's there is fear of God in the world, and that he, of course, has fear of God. He has not yet proved it to God. That is, of course, the Akeda. The Akeda proves that Abraham fears God. Kiata yadati kilo. I now know that you fear God, says the Akedah. But here, 
Abraham makes this presumption about the world. So we have three responses here, Marlene, Bob, and then John. Why do you make the assumption, if the Midrash is true, that Abraham worked for his father who made idols, people had the concept of a, of being greater than themselves, to whom or to something, that they had to have a, a system. Say that again, um, sorry. Say that, that's they had to have a system of beliefs or behaviors. They fed these gods. They they did things for them. So it's that they didn't have the God that Abraham wanted them to have or that they didn't have any gods? No, no, not at all. It, it's This is very interesting here. We can postulate that, that Avimelech is a God-fearing person just like Abraham is. He just wasn't chosen by God, but but he may in fact believe in the same god it's like it's like you know we we have relationships with with other you know people of faith they may not do you know they, they don't they don't believe in the torah but they still have a belief in god bilam the prophet is a very interesting character aside from you know other unsavory things about his character he has a relationship with god it's possible that God, God has a relationship with uh, with um, um, with uh, uh, other people besides Abraham. Okay, Bob. Yeah, there are three comments I wanted to make, but first I wanted to say that I don't see Abraham as pessimistic at all. Okay. Instead, instead I see him as exhibiting healthy paranoia <laughs> that, and being very careful because if he's about Chesed. He's also about possibility. So pessimistic he isn't for me, but a healthy paranoia is quite warranted. Yeah. Okay. So the, the three comments I wanted to make, the first is as I read through this, we often talk about the 10 tests of Abraham, but I actually see this test as not only his, but our tests. And in fact, all the people in the narrative are going through these types of tests at the same time. And they broaden from initially his to all the people we've been talking about. That's comment one. The yeah. second was one of the videos I sent you from the Sephardic rabbi who quotes something from the Orchaim Or from the 1700s, who wonders whether Sarah was the first Sota. And it's interesting that with her being segregated, she then is blameless in the end and then gives birth. And it's a very curious discussion as a sort of proto-Sota. Nice. Very I'm nice. About okay. that. And the final comment, which is a bigger one, which is all these stories about different types of survivorship deal with what we in the health and mental health professions are dealing with, which is not just burnout and compassion fatigue, but moral injury. And how does one, how does Abraham and everyone deal with the different types of moral injuries that are taking place in the world, just as the veterans here in wars were doing and what's going to be happening coming out of Gaza and Israel? Yeah, look, these this, you know, when we talk about collateral damage, you know, it's not only buildings, you know, human beings and and of course, you know, deaths of people. You know, what what is be beyond the, the 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 immediacy and the urgency of the moment, we know that that we already sense that I mean, I I we could have sensed this already on day one of this, that the the damage that was done in 10 hours is going to unfold over our lives and the lives of our loved ones and lives of Israel for decades. Look, we were just, it was, you know, the Arabs weren't stupid. You know, Hamas wasn't stupid in choosing that day. It was the day after the 50th anniversary of the Yom Kippur War. And there was nostalgia and there was there were, you know, I was planning to watch all of these documentaries on Israeli television about this, and and this blew it out of the water. And we're going to be talking about this for 50 years, because what's happening now is epoch-making in terms of, uh, you know, the, the way that the whole world is going, probably the whole world is, is going to have to realign itself. So the moral damage from this, I think, is very profound. And and people live the moral damage of Saddam, you know, also must have been quite profound. John, I really like Benny Lau's comments. Yes, but when he said there was no fear of God in Egypt, I thought of the 
Egyptian midwives who were such wonderful people. Perfect example. Yes. And I, I think what's beautiful is that the biblical writer, to me, it seems the biblical writer recognizes that there are good people everywhere. Absolutely. And that that's that's such a great point. And that goes, you know, it's, it's a we, we had a com, uh, uh, a class on this, you know, whether or not the, 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 the midwives in Egypt were Gentiles or Jews, you know, so to speak. Uh, and and um, the case is being made and he makes the case in, in his one of his lectures that they were not they were they were not what the tradition identifies as, you know, Yocheved and Miriam. They were they were Gentiles. They were Egyptians. And yeah. you said, you know, there are people in the world that that are moral. There are, you know, you, we, you Jews have this tendency to be sh sh morally chauvinistic, to think that, you know, we're the only ones that that at least have a tradition of, of kindness and goodness and morality. But in fact, that all human beings are capable of that. And many keep, people are, right? And that's the point. Stanley, you had your hand up there. Yeah, so you recall that last time I asked you why it was that Abraham had the assumption that he was going to be done in when he goes to, uh, at that time it was uh, Canaan, and here it's Sodom. And uh, your answer was that, well, you know, th th these places were dangerous, and who yeah. knows, he could have been uh, bumped off because of his beautiful wife. But Th this time, it seems like what you're saying or what the text is saying is that both Egypt and Sodom were known to be very bad places, that immoral, that these. So he, ha he had, in a sense, good reason uh, to be concerned. And then the irony is, well, it turns out Pharaoh and Abimelech are uh, not bad guys, that they're very insulted that he should think. Uh, Just Abimelech is a little bit. Abimelech was a good guy. Pharaoh was a bad guy. Abimelech was a good guy. <laughs> well, Pharaoh was was good in that. Well, he... Pharaoh seemed yeah, okay, insulted okay. Yeah, yeah, that yeah. Uh, Abraham should think that he yeah. would uh, treat him this way if uh, he had uh, not if he had known that it was uh, his his wife that he would kill him. In other words, sure. uh, for his wife. So, so is it then from what you said at the end? I'm wondering why this story is in twice also. I mean, the, the, the Bible, why did it include the same basic story? Now, there yeah. are differences and all, but there's got to be very important. And maybe the importance is that Abraham, as you said, learned a lesson about it. You can't make uh, broad assumptions about people. Sometimes it's one way, sometimes it's the other. You well, don't always know in advance. He was going on the best information he had, namely these were bad places, and I better act accordingly, you know? So, can't okay, so Yeah. It's actually three times that we're going to, you know, I, I, I don't want to pre 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 uh, judge what I'm going to do in a couple of weeks, but but it the story occurs again with Isaac and Rebecca. And there's an, uh, another variant of the story. And and people, there's a, there's a wealth of literature, you know, interpreting this and reading this. But I think I think your your observation is is correct, which is it's here in the case of Avram precisely to illustrate the contrast. You know, on the first occasion, yeah, I mean, and and if you recall, we were very sympathetic last week. I I, I taught Abraham the Abraham story in a very sympathetic light. You know, when he says um, to Sarah tell them you're my sister. I mean, it's, there's a certain intimacy there. There's a partnership there. And this, and, and that, I think it's a very compelling way to tell the story, but I think another way to, you know, now, now we're telling this story in light of that story. And as you correctly observe, it's different. The circumstances are different. The marriage is different. In my opinion, the marriage is way different. It's way different because there's just more, there's more water under the bridge now. There's another woman. There's a child. There's 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 been all sorts of experiences there, and now there's there's also the information that they're going to be a there's going to be a baby, and there's this. It's just just it's a it's a it's a very complicated place that marriage, and Gerar is not Egypt, and Avimelech is not Pharaoh, and these people are not those people, and this man is not the same man, and. I think that's the beauty of it. The beauty is we're watching in real time, so to speak, in real literary time, how a person 
goes through life and different experiences and changes and grows, becomes a little cynical, becomes a little bitter, becomes a little more righteous, becomes a little more wise into to the ways of the world. Um, is still, is still, you know, the question that that I'm stuck with here, you know, piggybacking on your question is that, you know, in light of the fact that that he, he, he just kind of struck out here morally, he just it's a, it's a very critical here. So why is he still a prophet? And why is he still, why is it on the basis of his prayer that Avimelech is going to be healed? And and I don't have a good answer. I have a bad answer. And it, the bad answer for me suffices, which is because, because that's the way it is, because God chose him. And if we go back to the, the, the kind of punchline of last week, which is, or my, you know, my talk on, is that that he, he God really loves him or God really is invested in Abraham and he's invested in Abraham to such an extent that he's not going to sell the stock right I, I really believe that it's like you know we've all had experiences where you invest in something and it goes down and down and down and then you go like oh my god oh my god you know and do you you know at what point do you say I'm out or at what point do you say I'm still going to hold on I'm still going to hold on because I believe in this. And so what I get from this is God, if we were to interview God, we would say, what were you thinking? And God would probably say, I was invested in him. And I, and, and he screwed up. And uh, this was a disappointing moment. But I, I know him well enough to know, and this is something that everyone could take away, that even you, even even an Abraham could have this moral dilemma and and moral penalty and and look at look at what he can become he can be the truly god-fearing person that i am seeking vis-a-vis -vis that okay steve barbara steve yes me talk um a last question go ahead <laughs> why didn't i wrote kill abraham or even avimelech and, you know, my theory is that Abraham was a chief of a very large tribe that was very important in those times. And even when he goes to bury Sarah, the Hebronites consider him a prophet, you know, a prince among us, right? But yeah. the question is, if Pharaoh was so upset, why didn't he kill him? Well, why didn't he kill Moses? And why, you know, so... Well, different you know, Pharaohs. No, I know. Uh, it, it's, <clears throat> look, it's a good question, and we we are, per, you know, retrojecting a certain kind of, you know, uh, very like we're we're reading the Sopranos into the the biblical text. Not everyone behaves that way, you know. The, later on in the Bible, people do behave that way. David certainly can be ruthless, and and others can be ruthless. It's it's not to their credit. Um, but everybody has their own interests in, in doing them. One of the interests is I can't, I can't, they're wise enough to know that they can't go around killing everyone. I'll give you just one contemporary example. Okay. You know, so we have a, we have Saudi Arabia and this, this guy, Mohammed bin Salman is ruthless. He's absolutely ruthless. The Khashoggi murder was ruthless. Okay. And it was impetuous. It was, I don't like him. So I'm going to have him killed. I'm going to send out my squad and lock him into an embassy. And and we're going to, you know, bring... I mean, it's just awful, awful, awful. And no one wants to talk to him. But all of a sudden, they have to talk to him. And and he needs... He wants to rehabilitate himself, okay? So part of rehabilitation is I need to make peace. I... I, I you know, whatever happened before the war started, and there was a lot of, you know, uh, mention about Israel and Saudi Arabia happening, all of it was on the surface, okay? The economics, the politics, etc. The you know, and, and of course, those are the drivers, okay? But there's one personal driver for this man, which is, I need to rehabilitate myself. And wouldn't it be great if I made peace, and all of a sudden, my name would be associated with people who would be then 
uh, nominated to win a Nobel Prize. Now, I, it, it's so it's so easy to see that a person who has been so defaced and and defamed by his own actions would want to at least rehabilitate himself. So everybody has their own interests in doing things, doing evil things or not doing evil things. And Pharaoh, you know, Pharaoh is a sadist. And this is the, the reason why he doesn't murder uh, Moses, I think, is because, you know, or maybe he's a masochist. I, you know, sometimes you don't know the difference, right? He, he, he enjoys this. He enjoys this, this sparring, okay? And and of course, you know, literally, of course, it would end the story right there. It doesn't make sense. But but the point is that that they don't do it because it's not in their interest to do it. They'll do it when it is in their interest, and they'll pay consequences for it. All right, let's leave it there. It was great today. Thank you so much. We'll see you next week. Okay, everybody, have a good week. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you.